Hello and welcome back to the Villa Villa podcast. I'm here as always with my good friend Dan Wiseman. Dan, Aston Villa 3, Brentford 3. I'm going to need some filling in, mate. I'm going to need some filling in. But before we get into all of that, how are you doing? Yep, yeah, I'm very well, thank you, mate. Very well indeed. Um, what a crazy 90 minutes. What a crazy, crazy 90 minutes. Um, I've just come off the back of watching the old firm as well which Great was, yeah apparently this is the weekend if you're a fan of absolutely chaotic three or draws this is the weekend for you it seems yeah absolutely absolutely we've a couple a couple big games still left to play as well at the time we're recording today as well so potentially so th- yep. there's, there's room for even more th- uh three or draws but who would who, who would know um but yeah I mean, like you know God, um, sort of lay all my cards out on the table with you guys. wasn't about yesterday. I've only seen extended highlights. Um, Dan, you caught the full game, so you'll have to paint a bit of a, a picture for me on how that went. Obviously, we take the lead, we go two 0 up, and I think it's it's cruise control. It's it's perfect. It's fine. Um, yeah. I was actually at a wedding yesterday, and I checked my phone. Uh, I'd I pulled it out just after. Uh, not too long after it had gone 2-0 and I'm thinking brilliant that's great my lamb roast had arrived I'm thinking life's good life's good let's get me fed pull my phone out maybe three minutes later maybe getting a little bit agitated trying to figure out the score 2-1 and I'm thinking oh god um, that's not good but you know we're still winning it's fine leave the phone on the table notification pops up less than a minute later 2-2 and I'm thinking oh god and then I, I didn't check until long after the game so it seemed like it was a crazy game mate and sort of from what I've heard from family members and 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 whatnot it sounds like we should have been totally out of sight at the point we hit 2-0 yeah and it it kind of felt like that to be honest with you it obviously the um the goal from you know obviously and not to kind of skip past the first one but we it wasn't a fantastic performance. We weren't cruising by any stretch of the imagination. And, and it had been, there were some kind of hairy moments in the first half, I think. There were a couple of good saves from Emmy, and we kind of went into half time. And it was really important that we, we got the goal when we did. And, you know, it was good to see kind of Guinea picking up an assist again. But, you know, Brentford had their fair share of chances. Uh, Brian and Bumo hits the side netting from a free kick relatively early on in the game. Um, and then we kind of, I think it's, yeah, just before the 40th minute, Oli puts us 1-0 up. We then get to the, I think it's 32 seconds, the other side of the restart. Morgan Rogers scores an absolutely fantastic goal, his first for the club. And the sun is shining on Villa Park. Morgan Rogers gets his first goal. We're two little up just going down into the second half. The march towards fourth place and Champions League football looks well and truly on. But I think it's, you know, and this is kind of to make it more of a, a general conversation and take it away from yesterday's game, mate. We have seen Villa do this kind of throughout the season. And the general form, particularly at home, has kind of covered this up. But the kind of the tendency to make home games in particular, even if it's not making them harder than they need to be, just letting go of a clean sheet has been something of a common theme. You know, we let, you know, if we if we go through our kind of recent home games, um, obviously there's the three or draw yesterday. Admittedly, there's the, the 2 0 win at Wolves, uh, against Wolves, which is very professional. Uh, we conceded four at home to uh, Spurs, 4 2 at home to Forest. That one was definitely more complicated than it needs to be. We can see three at home to Chelsea. We've got the FA Cup game where we can see three at home. Uh, You know, and you kind of go back through the fixtures, 3-2 at home to Burnley. That was, you know, required a late winner there to get through in that game. We've got, and you can kind of go back, the further you go back through the season, even if it games where the Fulham game at home, it's 3-1 rather than a 3-0. Luton got an away goal against us. West Ham got an away goal against us. And it's like, Obviously, you know, you can't complain too much because we have been winning these games. But the tendency to let sides, even if it's just get one or get back into the game, is something that has been going under the radar, I think, a little bit because generally we have been picking up points. 
but we do have a tendency to do this in home games and I was kind of having conversations about what is causing this because I, I don't want to call it complacency because I don't necessarily think it is but it's kind of hard to think like what else this could be and because it happens on such a consistent basis for us to completely fall apart once we conceded one yesterday was quite surprising because as I, had, as I said sides we've gone a couple of goals up and then a, a team has come to Villa Park and scored and we've had to kind of see it out or maybe get another several times this season but our heads just completely imploded um, yeah. and we couldn't make a pass we couldn't play out of our own half and as soon as they got the the, the second you knew that the third was almost coming we just completely crumbled and yeah, it was kind of when I was thinking of the context of this game, that kind of trend emerged. And, you know, you've been to more home games than myself this season, mate, so you'll have seen it firsthand. But it is something that the Villa have made a bit of an unhabit, unwanted habit of doing, really. Yeah, you're right. I, I think the thing is, like, the attitude, the atmosphere, it completely changes in the stadium the moment we concede, regardless of whether, you, you know, we concede first or last or, you know, we've scored three before they've scored whatever. I was just looking back at them fixtures, as you'd said, mate, and obviously aside from the Wolves game, it looks like the last home game where we managed to get a win under clean sheet was against Arsenal all the way back in December. And that was a very long time ago. And I think it's fair to say, since that point, we've seen probably two different sort of variations of, of this Villa team and this Emery system due to personnel, due to just, you know, tactical tweaks and whatnot as well. So, and obviously that's, you know, within the same week where we go and do the same thing uh, a couple of days before with Manchester City, right? And yeah, I think it is worrying. And I think as well, I'm sort of going off the dome here, but I would probably attribute a lot of goals that we concede at home to allowing too much space down wide areas and crosses into the box. And it felt like that was the, you know, that was the tale of how Brentford got their three goals yesterday, mate, wasn't it? And for all of the, the plaudits that, that Pau and that Diego deserve, uh, and rightfully so, by the way, you know, that just because we conceded three goals yesterday, it doesn't mean they're bad players at all. I can't help but feel that crosses into the box is an area where both of them especially, and probably especially Pau, struggle a lot in defending with and you know we kind of spoke about this at the start of the season didn't we mate we were sort of worried that there would be this sort of theme with Pau Torres and I guess you do have to take the rough with the smooth but especially for Brentford's second goal Pau's nowhere near uh, is it in Buemo for the second goal absolutely nowhere near like he, there's, there's a good five or six yards between them and by the time the ball's landed at in Buemo's feet I was barely even turned around himself. He's, he's seemingly in no man's land. And, uh, you know, I'm not sort of singling him out to be like, what a terrible player, because obviously you guys who listen to the podcast absolutely know where we stand with all of these guys. But I was kind of thinking, well, it's was, it was probably two weeks ago, I, 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 was, I was sort of saying to my dad, I don't think Mings gets back in this Villa side the way that Power had been playing and, and Diego had been looking good and obviously... If you sort that right back position out, Ezri's obviously going to occupy with the space. But it is games like this where you really miss Tyrone and Ezri specifically, you know, within the context of him actually playing as a centre half. Um, I think it's just something that we're seeing far too much of. And like, obviously, you can attribute it to defenders not dealing with aerial threats, but also like stopping the cross. How many times have we? said out of possession Morgan Rogers there's yeah. you know leaves a lot to be desired same with uh Bailey that you know there's been exponential improvements in Bailey's uh all-round game just in general but too often teams are able to get the ball out wide and go relatively unchallenged in getting a ball into the box and again that's how we almost ended up with all three of the goals yesterday really yeah, you know, if, if you kind of, if you do, look, Powell's been absolutely fantastic this season, as you rightly say, mate, but if you kind of watch all three goals and focus on him, and look, I'm not, as I don't want to sing them out because you can pretty much pick out any of the defenders in it for at least one of the goals, there's more that they could have done, but Powell gets kind of 
he's kind of lost in no man's land for all three of the goals. And look, there there is an element of fortune, particularly to the first one from from Jorgensen, where the ball kind of comes in. He swings at it with his right foot. He completely misses the ball. It hits his left foot and then ends up in the bottom corner. Like it's it's a freak goal, really. Um, and so th- there are elements of fortune to the goals. But yeah, that second one from Mbumo is is really interesting because, and really so, like on, on commentary, they're waxing lyrical about the movement from Mbumo. And it's it's really interesting when you kind of watch him because he kind of makes a nod like he's going to run to the front post, drops off, goes backwards. The ball is then, it kind of goes up. It floats over Powell, who's kind of taken a step forward towards the near post. He just gets completely lost under the flight of the ball. And then from across completely like out on the left wing and Bumo is able to tap it home from kind of knee height really he, he kind of power gets completely lost under the flight of the ball and look like you know it is it's very good strikers instinct from Mbuma but as you as you kind of say it's one where um you do miss six or five time of mings in those situations but you know it, it, you can also kind of flip that on its head and say that um you know if it was God forbid, Paul Torres, who had been out for the season, and Tyrone that have been playing. Whilst, yes, you might get some more defensive solidity, you're not going to have the line splitting passes and potentially the kind of, you know, it's we've conceded three goals yesterday, but we've also scored three goals yesterday, and we know how important Paul Torres is going forward. So we have said all season that Paul Torres has been fast, fantastic, but the rough is to be taken with the smooth. And, you know, he's probably not going to be a defensive colossus that, throws himself in front of shots and is heading away corners and set pieces and, you know, all that kind of... He's not that kind of footballer. That's more Diego Carlos, who, you know, is alongside him, who I thought, in terms of just strict defensive play, there were some really good moments from him, particularly in the first half, kind of sweeping in behind, blocking shots, covering for the more offensive Pau Torres. And I thought Diego did a really good job of that yesterday. But, yeah, it's, it's really... Interesting, and that kind of the mood around Villa Park definitely does change. But I, I do, I do kind of said as I kind of said when I uh, I spoke about this game that the reason we have lost this game is because we just completely lost our ability to go forward. And I know when the defending is as bad as it is for the three goals, that sounds kind of crazy. But watching it, it was almost coming just because the amount of times that. All members of the midfield really gave it away. Zaniolo came on and he couldn't really catch a break. Diaby came on and it was kind of the same thing. We just could not play through the thirds, no matter who it was. And so the defence were left in the lurch on a lot of occasions. And, you know, when you're giving the ball away 30 yards, 20 yards of points from your own goal, the defence is naturally kind of going to be an array and I, I do have a little bit of sympathy for them there because they were left in some very precarious situations a lot of chances as you say coming from the wings which you know are part and parcel of how Brentford play obviously they had that three at the back Russ Levin Reguilon out wide you know what they're going to do they're going to try and hit the byline pin balls back into the cross for Mbuma with Sir Tony whoever's on the pitch and they were just kind of allowed to do so at will. We were just giving the ball to them in the middle of the park and they were putting these passes out wide and we just had no answer for it. And I do believe that that's the reason that we lost this game. And and so I think it's right to single out the defending. I think that's needless to say, particularly ahead of such an important European game, that's what we'll be working on this week. But yeah, it it was something to note from Villa because the way that we've been able to draw teams onto us and play through them has been not just a strength, of this season but the entire blueprint really that's kind of what this whole thing this whole campaign has been built on this you know every style of football and we just completely forgot how to do it yesterday and um that that's the thing that was i'm not gonna say concerning it's not the right word i'm i'm, I'm not concerned by this result but that's the, the kind of interesting thing for me is that um we just kind of capitulated in that regard yeah i think like to sort of zoom out big picture as we kind of spoke about con- just conceding too many home goals need to tighten that up and and hopefully things will get better I think you know there, there was an interesting point you made about Diego I, I think Diego is a fantastic defender but I, I kind of like Ty I think there are sort of laps of concentration I just wondered what you thought about that mate because I think for the big games I think you can almost always rely on Diego you know it, Again, a customer mind back to the Man City home game, the Arsenal home game, Spurs away. In 
all of Villa's big wins against the sort of top six teams, however you want to look at it, I feel like Diego's always executed and I think you've always been able to say, yeah, like you walk away after the game, Diego was solid today. We would have conceded God knows how many without his interventions. But in games like this, and again, I didn't see the full night, so I don't have the full the full picture in this instance. But you know, I can I can speak on other occasions where I've you know watched him at home or, or even away from home against other teams, and it kind of feels like there is a similar sort of lapse of concentrate. But maybe complacency, like you said, is maybe the word that I would I would perhaps use. Yeah, it, it, he is an interesting one, and I I think Diego like in terms of being a true centre-back that like Diego Carlos, I, I do believe this is a centre-back that kind of transcends eras. He's the archetypal centre-back. I think his game is as well suited to the 1990s as it is the 2020s. Like he he's not a kind of modern centre-back, so to speak. And I don't know whether it is because you can kind of see when he, and I think you get a better sense of this in person. And I kind of really saw this at the Etihad midweek in that, he doesn't he doesn't move freely at points, particularly when he's kind of moving with the ball at pace. You can kind of see that the knee injury is is not this I don't know if hindering him is the right word because you know, I, I I don't think that there's any pain there, but you can kind of see that he, he moves like someone that did their knee at thirty years old. Yeah. I think he's the best way to kind of say it. And I, I think that kind of has taken an impact on his game whilst I know that kind of doesn't really speak to the kind of mental aspect of his game, but I do think that he has certainly kind of taken a knock in in that regard, and he's perhaps not quite the defender that we signed. And, and was he he's been absolutely fantastic. And to be honest with you, I didn't think he would come back to kind of reach the levels that he has this season. But yeah, he he if you look at Johan Wisser's goal, it's kind of played out to the wide Reggian and. Wissa kind of drifts off to the back of him and he's kind of left in this sprawling mess on the edge of the six-yard box as he tre- attempts to kind of tow it out for a corner. And and so th- there have been moments definitely this season where Diego has been left wanting. I I don't think necessarily he can kind of play through the back um, as, you know, perhaps we wanted a sense back to kind of to do. And I think there are times where it kind of feels like he's an Emery signing. He's not. He's a Gerrard signing. And, and you know, right. it kind of feels like He's this brand new shiny player that we've just seen because of how long he was out for. It's only really this season where he's come back. But I mean, yes, I I, I definitely do think that. Yeah, at, at moments he's been kind of left. I, I, I think ideally we we'd still want to be kind of playing Konsa inside. I still think Ezra Konsa is is the best true centre back at the club, but, but we know that kind of Unai isn't necessarily the biggest fan of Matty Cash and so he's kind of had to be played out wide and, and has done very well there but yeah I think Carlos definitely has that in his game and I kind of think that when you see him um, it it wouldn't surprise me if kind of Diego Costa is one of those players that in a couple of years once he hits 32-33 with that knee injury just kind of falls off a cliff to be honest with you but the levels that he has been hitting kind of this season have been very impressive on the whole yeah Talking about impressive levels, mate. Oliver George Arthur Watkins. We said a few months ago, or maybe I said, I don't want to potentially label you, uh, but bunch bunch you into my comment because we did get quite a lot of uh, of, of, of angry commenters uh, mentioning Dwight York. This is this guy has to be the best striker of our lifetime, mate. Uh, you know, caveated with with twenty four, twenty five. Uh, Ollie Watkins. 28 goal involvements in a Premier League season. The first Aston Villa player ever to do that in the Premier League. 18 goals, 10 assists at the time of recording. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. And it's the variety of goals as well, especially for the um, the equalising goal, the header, that sort of cushioned header. We've seen him do that a fair bit over the past year and a half. Left foot, right foot, head. Oli can do it all. Oli will do it all, and I mean, just got to count our lucky stars, mate. That that he's ours, right? Yeah, he obviously leads the Premier League at the moment in goal contributions, and 
Kind of the way that it's going, looks like he could well see that out. So he has 28 goal contributions, as you say, in the Premier League this season, mate. Uh, the closest to that is Mo Salah on, on 25. Uh, you've got Erling Haaland and Cole Palmer on 24. Kim Min-son on 23. Bakaya Saka on 22. So he's three clear of Mo Salah, who, um, you know, is kind of... Struggle a little bit with injury, being away at Afcon and stuff like that, and so there's there's a chance that he could end this season, kind of top of that metric, and that's just incredible. It really is. I, um, you know, looking at the numbers, there's perhaps only kind of one. You know, those that did watch Dwight York can probably hold a candle to say that yeah, Oli has beaten Dwight York's best goal like goal contributions in a season. He got 27 in 95, 96, so that header to kind of tie it. At three three, put Oli one ahead in that regard. But um, yeah, what those that perhaps did favour York will say is that the next season, Dwight York then followed it up with twenty three, and so Oli's kind of got. Well, I think once Oli, you know, and, and you imagine that he will, given how he's played this season, if he can go and put even not as good of a season, but you know, another season where he gets over twenty goal contributions in the Premier League next season, and kind of if he can maintain these levels then yeah, I mean, the, there's virtually no argument whatsoever. I still think he's got to get a few more goals and I, I don't have the numbers to hand. I don't think he's reached... I think he... I believe Benteke might even have got 20 Premier League goals or, or there or thereabouts. And so he needs to kind of get a few more goals to be the outright top goal scorer in a Premier League season for Aston Villa. I, I think Benteke still holds that record, but... There's still plenty of time to go in this season. There's still plenty of time to go. And yeah, I mean, Oli's just been... What do you even say? What do you even say, mate? Yeah. You're absolutely right. You know, we have put a lot of titles up on YouTube this season. Like, Oli Watkins, is he one of the best strikers in Europe? Is he the best in the Premier League? And whilst those have been slightly hyperbolic, I think it's fair to say, like, when you look at these numbers, like, how long do we go on before we keep having those conversations? Like, what more do kind of people need to see to kind of that goes from being something that's maybe a little bit tongue-in-cheek to kind of where you start going, well, yeah, like this season, he is genuinely kind of in that elite company and it is the longevity that separates Ali from those guys kind of if we're being serious. But with the way that he's playing, this doesn't feel like a flash in the pan. This doesn't feel like something that's going to tail off and that next season he's going to be back to knocking around the 10, 15 goal contributions mark. It's hard to imagine a, a world in which, okay, maybe he's not going to... I mean, looks like he could cross 30 for this season, which is just insane. Like, we're obviously not going to expect those levels. But if he becomes a kind of striker, and it looks like he can be, that's going to kind of average above 20 a season, like, what an asset for this football club. Oh, mate, absolutely. And I think the thing the thing with Oli, and I, the thing that I think a lot of people neglect to sort of contextualise with the Ollie Watkins because I, I still think Villa fans are still pretty divided as to whether they rate him or not which for me is crazy um, but you know you guys do your thing but for me it's the fact that each season he's bettered his goals tally first season was like 11 then it was 14 then it was 15 and now we're already on 18 goals with 7 6 games left of the season so you know, again, and the 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 proof will be in the pudding is if he manages to improve next season or even to maintain, you would say that Ollie Watkins is still. In, you know, he he, end, he he ends next season with the same amount of goal contributions, whatever, or there or thereabouts. That's still another fantastic season, regardless of whether he you know tops that tally or not, because it looks like he's going to end comfortably in the twenties for goals and comfortably within the thirties, as you say, for combined goals and assists, mate. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I wanted to give Morgan a shout out because yeah. I think he's probably one of the most exciting prospects we've had for quite a while now. And yeah, you know, there are flaws to his game, which, you know, we've acknowledged many a time. But when he has the ball at his feet, I'm just so excited. And that little, the, you know, the way he received the ball, shifted it from right to left, puts, the, uh, puts his shot across the body. It felt very Zizou. It felt very Zizou, that goal. Uh, in no way am I making a direct comparison, but uh, th that sort of tall, powerful, attacking midfield player, big frame, explosive pace, sensational dribbler on the ball. I think Unai has, and, and, and Monchi and the team have, have unearthed a gem. I think Morgan Rogers is brilliant and I can't wait to see 
what happens to him within the next 12 months because you know we could be at the back end of next season and I mean God knows what he could you know the, the sort of output that this guy could be producing on a on a regular basis he, he's a fascinating player he is a fascinating player because he kind of goes from you kind of sign some players sometime and they kind of perform at a consistent level and you can kind of see bits of the, their game and you can kind of really see the vision whereas Morgan Rogers he goes from like looking sometimes like a player that we we have just plucked from the championship as he should we have yeah. you know just three months ago plucked from the championship but then all of a sudden it's not even like you get a glimpse of kind of oh that could be coming in the future it's like he kind of morphs five ten years into the future and would just deliver a moment that's like if he was delivering that like a consistent basis at the end of his career, you know, you would be so impressed. He just morphs all of a sudden into like the finished products. Like he's he's a crazy player in that he kind of goes from one minute looking like a really raw kind of unearthed diamond to like looking like the full package. And you get this brief spell like that. That goal yesterday is kind of what we, if we kind of are getting that on a consistent basis in a few years' time, uh, we have a real genuine talent on our hands and. I just think he's fascinating because, like, for one minute he he can go and look like a player that's only kind of, you know, this is I think his fourth Premier League start in a row, the first of which was his first ever in the Premier League. So it's been a real baptism of fire for him. You know, he's been fussed into this side, not necessarily because that's what we envisaged him doing, but because we kind of had to. In truth, you know, they were speaking a lot on on commentary for the game yesterday about you know, you know, I shown tremendous faith in him and all this kind of stuff and to a to a large extent that is true but it's not necessarily what Unai wanted to be doing he has shown a lot of faith in him but he was his hand was kind of forced in that regard we have had to play Morgan Rogers, and you know fair play to him he, he's taken that like opportunity fantastically but yeah it is really quite impressive like he goes from looking like as you say, this player that's got so much to learn, so much to develop, to looking like the finished products, kind of minute on minute, and kind of flitters between the two rather than kind of operating at a consistent basis of that you see from a lot of young players, really, where you can kind of you get a, you watch their game and you get a general idea of what they might look like in the future. You kind of see it minute on minute from Morgan Rogers, and so that's what I think is the next step for his game is kind of operating at that level consistently rather than kind of being able to do it in set situations in a game. And so that will come with time. But yeah, my, what a start. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The best is yet to come. Uh, guys, let us know your thoughts on this frustrating result in the comment section down below. Dan and I will be back over the next day or so to preview the uh, Lil game boy yeah. that's come around quick that has come around incredibly fast uh, a huge game so you guys are going to want to make sure that you are subscribed to the channel uh, if you listen on apple or spotify make sure you share follow download helps out more than you guys can imagine so yeah like comment subscribe and up the villa